harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will, he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me, send me. Life on the Edge will enable you to be an effective harvester for the Lord. We now invite you into our classroom to come experience life. We'd like to welcome you back to the Lay Institute for Evangelism. We'd like to welcome those of you that are, that are at home into our classroom. You are going to experience life today. The topic that we're going over today is the second part or the second half of our Law of God study. We've already covered the first half of this study and now we're going to go right into the second half. So if you'll go to the graphic there, you'll note that the topic of this study is the Law of God. You'll also see there on your screen that the purpose of this Bible study is to show that God's law is still valid today. To show that keeping God's law is an expression of our love for Him. Now there's some of you at home that have not seen the first half of this presentation. And you'll want to make sure that you watch that because this is a continuation of the first one. And it's in the first one where we talked about Jesus, we talked about grace, and we talked about the biblical definition of sin. And we're going to give you an illustration of that in just a moment. Every one of our Bible studies here at Life during this Life on the Edge course are centered on Jesus Christ. Our screen shows us that the center it today is if we do away with God's law, we have done away with sin. If there is no sin, we do not need grace to overcome sin. If we do not need grace, then we do not need the author of grace, Jesus Christ. By doing away with the law, we do away with Jesus. And as you recall, in our studies, we're marking these in the front of our Bible or the back of our Bible so that we can then give the studies to other people in their homes or at the office or wherever it is we want to give a study. You see there on the graphic that we have 17 texts in this Bible study. And these 17 texts are divided into four different sections. Jesus, grace, sin, and law. In the first half of our study, we talked about Jesus, grace, and sin. And today we're going to be talking about the law. The next two graphics that you see there are just these four divisions with a larger font so that you can see those those references there. And again, for those of you at home, if you haven't gone to our website, comeexperiencelife.com, you want to go to our website where you can download the handouts from our website, and that way you'll be able to follow along not only on the television screen, but you'll also be able to follow along on those notes. The next graphic here is just the larger font of the text that we use to define sin and then the text that we're going to talk about now as we talk about the law of God. Before we get into this study though, I need to have four volunteers. Four volunteers. So Shalita, if you could come up front and, uh, uh, oh, come on, what am I doing this for? Get up here, Mike. And Tom, and how about you, um, uh, uh, Mercy, Jessica, come on up here. All right, so we're just going to start over here on this side of the room. And uh, Shalita, you are going to represent the law. Okay, so Shalita is the what? The law. She's the law. You are going to represent, and I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> You're going to represent sin. Sin. He does have a black shirt on today, so that's, that's fine. You are going to represent, Mike, you are going to represent grace. And Jessica, you are going to represent Jesus. Now, how many of you, maybe some of you at home, maybe people here in the classroom, you have heard others say that the law of God was nailed to the cross. Have you ever heard somebody say that? That the law of God was nailed to the cross. Well, let's suppose that God's law was nailed to the cross. So law, you're nailed to the cross, you have a seat. If we do not have the law, 
then we do not have the biblical definition of sin because sin, as you remember from our previous program, sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. So since we don't have a law anymore, in theory, then we don't have what? Sin. sin. So sin, why don't you just go ahead and have a seat? Now the Bible told us in our last program that grace was the power of God. Do you remember that? We used three references to show that grace is the power of God that saves us through our faith. But since we don't need to be saved from sin anymore because we don't have a law whereby sin is defined, then we don't need grace to help us overcome sin. Do you understand? So grace, we don't need you. So you can just have a seat. And you can see where this is going, can't you? You can see exactly where this is headed. If we don't need grace, the Bible told us in John chapter 1 verse 14, John chapter 1 verse 14 says that, and, we, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the one that became flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten of the Father, is who? Jesus. So it's Jesus that's full of grace and truth. Since we don't need grace because we don't have sin to overcome because there is no law, then who else don't we need? We don't need Jesus. So Jesus, please have a seat. You see how dangerous it is for us to say that we do not need or the law has been nailed to the cross. That's dangerous, isn't it? Because if the law was nailed to the cross and thereby done away with, no longer valid, then there is no biblical definition of sin. There's no standard by which to measure the difference between right and wrong. So, no law, no sin. No sin, we don't need grace to overcome sin because there is no sin. And if we don't need grace to overcome sin, then we don't need who? Jesus. Are you comfortable doing away with Jesus? I'm not comfortable doing away with Jesus either. Why am I not comfortable? Why are you not comfortable? Because we need Jesus to give us His grace to help us overcome sin. And all of us, the Bible says, sin. That was even after the cross that the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That was even after the cross. So we still have sin, which is defined biblically as the transgression of God's law. So we don't want to do away with the law, do we? Because if we do away with the law, we ultimately do away with our Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Now, again, this is going to be a little bit more review for those of you that are at home, for those of you that didn't watch the first program. So we're going to go back to our screen now, and you will see there that... <clears throat> Let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel. You don't have to turn there. I actually have a slide for it. Uh, you'll note there on the screen, Daniel 7.25 says, And he, speaking of the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times in the dividing of time. <clears throat> now, the Antichrist power thinks to change God's times and God's law. Is it possible for anyone to change God's time or God's law? It's not. That's why this reference says thinks to change. He wants to change it, but he can't change it because when God says something, it stands fast, doesn't it? So over here on the Antichrist side of your screen, we've put Daniel 7.25. We're just going to change the, this, the slide there. And you will see that Antichrist wants to change God's law. Now notice on your screen, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, the Bible says, Think not that I am come, Jesus is speaking, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be, what's the word? Fulfilled. Fulfilled. So you notice on our next screen here, the Antichrist says that God's law will change. Jesus Christ says the law will not change. 
So listen very closely. Any interpretation of Scripture that seeks to change or do away with God's law is a product of Antichrist. Let's, let me refer, say that again. Any interpretation of Scripture that seeks to change God's law is a product of who? Antichrist, that's right. So as we go through the rest of this study today, we are going to be, we've already looked at Jesus, we've already looked at grace, we've already looked at sin, and now we are going to focus on the law. So let's go to our uh, next slide there. You see it simply has a title, which is Law. And now we're going to go to our 11th, I believe it's our 11th, it is, our 11th reference. Our 11th reference is Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. This is the tail end of the sin, the sin aspect of the four divisions of this study. So we'll pick up there at the very last reference uh, speaking about sin and the result of sin and then we will go into our 12th text where it talks about the law of God. So we're going to the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59, and um, I'll go ahead and read this one today, or this one, this, this text right here, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that He cannot save, neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear. So just notice in this text right here, when you're giving this Bible study, what you're drawing out of this text is that God's hand is not too short to save someone. What do you say to that? Amen. Amen. Then it says, neither his ear too heavy that he cannot hear. So is God able to save us regardless of where we are in our walk, yes. in our life? He is. His hand is not too short that he can't reach down and save us nor is his ear too heavy that he cannot hear us. Notice the first word in verse 2. The first word in verse 2 is what? But. but. That means in total contradiction to what was just said. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear too heavy that it cannot hear, but, notice what it says here, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So sin is a thing to be avoided, isn't it? Because sin or iniquity separates us from God. So if you and I cherish sin something that we know to be wrong, something that we know displeases God, if we cherish it, and some people say, but I don't cherish sin. Do you have something in your life that you're not struggling with, that you continually do, and you know displeases God? Some people will say to me, but you know, Pastor, I'm not convicted that I should stop. You don't have to be convicted to know whether something is right or wrong. If the Bible tells us that it's wrong, whether we are convicted or not, then we know that it is what? Wrong. So when God shows us something and we refuse to do it, when God is working on our hearts but we refuse to follow what God is asking us to do, then we are cherishing sin. So when you're giving this Bible study, it's very important that the people that you're giving the Bible study to understand that God can save anyone that comes to Him. In a moment, He can save them. But though, for those of us that are saved, we must be very careful not to cherish sin. We must try to remove ourselves from sin. But we can't do that without what? Grace, which is the power of God and who was full of grace? Jesus was full of grace. So we have seen here that in the sin aspect that sin separates 
or puts a gap between us and God? Is it because God doesn't want to be with us? No, God wants to be with us. But God gives us the power of choice and He'll never force us. If we choose sin, He'll let us go that way because He won't force us. So now we've, we've finished up with sin there. And again, those of you at home will want to watch the first half of this if you haven't. And our next reference here, moving right into the law texts, is Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. So often I hear people say that the law of God does not matter to the Christian experience today. It just doesn't make a difference. But what does the Bible say in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17? Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. We will go ahead and let uh, Shalita read this. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. So those of you at home, you're turning to Revelation chapter 12, you're turning to the 17th verse, and now she's going to read for us. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, so the Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman. Who is the dragon? Satan. Satan. So those of you that are marking your Bibles right above that where it says dragon, you may want to put a reference. Just put Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 is what tells us that the dragon is the same as Satan or the devil. So just write Revelation 12, 9 right above that word dragon, and then you'll be able to explain that. So it says, and the dragon was wroth. What does the word wroth mean? It means angry or enraged. That's right. The dragon, who is the devil, so the devil is enraged with the woman. Now, in Bible prophecy, when we're in the, uh, the New Testament apocalyptic or end time book, in Bible prophecy, Bill, tell me, what does a woman represent? The church. That's right. The, yeah, do that again. Why don't you do that again? The church. That's right. So, in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a church. So, this text is telling us that the devil is angry with a Church, that's absolutely right. And then it says, as Shalita read, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, and then it describes the children or the seed of the church. And how does it describe them? There's two characteristics there. How does it describe them? All right, pick up that microphone and tell me, how, how are they described? Go ahead and pick that microphone up. It's all right. Follow His commandments and follow Jesus. That's right. So the, the people that Satan is angry with are the people that are keeping the commandments of God and those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So at the end of time, does God expect His people to be keeping His commandments? He does. Does the devil get mad at people that aren't keeping the commandments? No. Does the devil get mad at people that are not keeping the commandments? No, he doesn't. The devil likes it, doesn't he? Because you remember, any interpretation of Scripture that seeks to do away with God's law is a product of who? The Antichrist. You've always got to keep that in the random access memory of your brain. Because any interpretation of Scripture that seeks to do away with God's law pleases Antichrist. And if we please Antichrist, we're not pleasing Jesus Christ. That's right. So, now you see there on your screen that there's another reference that we can use here, and it's in parentheses. So we're going to look at it. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. So some of you may have to turn a page some of you may not. And we will go ahead and we will let Mike Mudd read this, if you don't mind. Revelation, the 14th chapter. Those of you at home, if you haven't gotten your Bible yet, you recognize now that you have a need of getting your Bible. So go grab that. Revelation, the 14th chapter and the 12th verse. Mike. 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So here's the patience of who? The saints. The saints. And then it defines a saint. This is the biblical definition of a saint. The Bible says that a saint is someone that does two things. And what were those things, Mike? They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. So again, simply ask the person that you're giving the Bible study to, simply ask them, is the keeping of the commandments of God important to God's last day or God's end time people? It's important, isn't it? Because that is the distinguishing aspect between God's people and then the people that want to change God's law. Now some people say, well, God is much too gracious. He is much too merciful to make me keep His law. But you will remember in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus didn't say, keep my law because I'm making you keep it, did He? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the question is not about, do I have to do it? The question is, how much do I love Jesus? And if I love Jesus with all of my heart, then all of my heart is going to want to keep all of His what? Of His commandments. Now, in, the, in our introduction, we used a reference, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. We're going to go back to that reference in our Bible study because that is the springboard that we are going to use to launch into the Ten Commandments. Now, the purpose of this Bible study is simply to show that God's law is still valid today and the keeping of God's law is a response of love from the one that loves God. So the purpose of this study is not to focus on any one of the commandments. In this Bible study, you are not focusing on just the first commandment. You're not focusing on just the third commandment. You're not focusing just on the seventh commandment or the fourth commandment or the third commandment. You're focusing on all of them. You're laying a foundation for the study that comes after this. And the study that comes after this one is a Bible study on the Sabbath. So what you have to do, for those of you that are giving Bible studies and using these studies, you, you give this Bible study on week 7. This is the seventh Bible study in this series. And then you wait a week, and then in the eighth week, the, at the eighth study, is when you bring in the topic of the Sabbath. Today, when you're giving this study on week 7, you're not singling out any one of the commandments. For those of you that love the Sabbath of God, for those of you that love the fourth commandment, our temptation is going to be just to hammer home the Sabbath during this Bible study. But that is not the goal of this Bible study because the other commandments are just as important, aren't they? They sure are. The Bible says if we break one, we have broken them all, and that's in James chapter 2. So this, this uh, reference here in Matthew chapter 5, we'll go ahead and let Mrs. Gloria read that for us. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. We're using this reference again just as a springboard into the commandments, and I'll show you exactly why after we read it. So Mrs. Gloria, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by, by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So Mrs. Gloria, I've been studying with people and people will tell me, you want to hold that microphone there because I'm going to have you read one more reference. People will tell me that that word right there, fulfill, means that Jesus fulfilled it. Therefore, I don't have to live in regard to the law. So basically what they're saying is Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus did away with it so that I wouldn't have to live in reference to the law or that, so that I wouldn't have to keep God's law. If that word fulfill, Mrs. Gloria, if that word fulfill means to do away with, then we've got some real concerns. Turn very quickly to Matthew, the third chapter. This is not in your notes. This is just extra 
extra stuff here. So Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. So, Mrs. Glory, if you'll go ahead and read that for us. I want you to notice the use of the word fulfill. If fulfill means to do away with, then listen to what it would mean here. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So if that word fulfill means to do away with, then that means that Jesus there in that reference came to do away with all righteousness. So certainly that's not what the word fulfill means, is it? It can't mean that. So you may in the margin of your Bible in Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and 18, you may want to circle or underline the word fulfill and then just put a little reference there to go to Matthew chapter 3 verse 15. That way, when you're giving the study, even those of you at home, when you're giving this study to your co-workers, to your friends, to your, your family, when they say, well, it says right there, Jesus fulfilled the law, so it's done away with. You can go to Matthew chapter 3 and show that Jesus did not do away with the law by fulfilling the law. He certainly fulfilled it. He filled it so full of meaning that He said, I tell you the truth. The law says... Thou shalt not commit adultery, but if any of you looks lustfully upon a woman, you have committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus fulfilled it. He filled it full of more meaning than they ever thought the law had. And so the Bible says there in Matthew chapter 5, 17 and 18, that Jesus came to fulfill the law. And then it says, I tell you the truth, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. When, as long as there is an earth, as long as there is heaven or a place to breathe, God's law will be valid. Do you see that principle there? Because we are going to use this principle, this principle to springboard into the commandments. And so what I do, again, let me just stress this again. This, the purpose of this study is not to focus on any one of the commandments. The purpose of this study is to lay the foundation for the following study, which is a Bible study, on the Sabbath. So we're, when we go to the commandments, it is probably one of the hardest things. You know, I gave this Bible study to Ronnie and Alex uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's the hardest thing when you're giving this study not to just launch into the next Bible study, which is on the Sabbath. Because you get to the first commandment, people are like, yeah. You get to the third commandment, yeah. You get to the fourth commandment, yeah. And then you just want to say, but why aren't you doing it? But you can't do that during this study. You need that week of time for the Spirit of God to take the, this Bible study and the truth that is in this and to just bury it in their hearts, to get that seed firmly planted so that it can grow into a plant that will produce fruit in righteousness. So we're going now to the Ten Commandments. We're going to go to our 14th. We're going to go to our 14th reference in this Bible study. And that's going to be the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. We'll begin reading in verse 1. And we're going to let Bill read this. Let's go to Exodus. Genesis, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. Now, Bill, when I give this Bible study... I allow the people that are, I'm giving the Bible study to, I allow them to read it to me. And then I stop them at the end of each one of those commandments and I ask a question. And remember, the basis, the, the springboard for taking us to the commandments was that Jesus said that uh, until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And so we still have an earth, don't we? We still have heaven because we're breathing, don't we? And so I'm going, just going to ask, I'm going to ask this question and it will get redundant but it will prove a, the very basic point that God's law is still valid. And this is the question that I ask. D according to the words of Jesus, is this part of His law still valid today? That's the question. According to the words of Jesus, is this part of His law still valid today? And so why don't you read the first commandment for us? You will read verses 1, 2, and 3. And God spoke all these words, saying... I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so stop right there. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, does Jesus still consider this part of his law to be valid today? Yes. Yes, yes he does. Okay, next commandment. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay. So then again, I just ask the simple question. This is the second commandment in the ten. According to the words of Jesus, does Jesus still consider this part of his law valid today? Yes, yes he does. Now, I want you to notice something, Bill, at the very end there in verse 6 of the second commandment. It says, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that what? Love me, Love me and keep my, keep my commandments. So the keeping of the commandments comes after you and I love God, doesn't it? So again, the keeping of the commandments is not in order to be saved. The keeping of the commandments is because you are saved. If Jesus saves you, that's what gives you the motivation and the, the love motivation to keep God's law. So let's go to the third commandment. That's verse 7, Bill. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So according to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, does Jesus still consider this part of his law valid today? Yes. Yes, he does. All right, let's go to the fourth commandment. So you read verses 8 through to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in, this, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, is this part of God's law still valid today? Yes. It is, absolutely. So let's go to the fifth commandment. Honor verse, your, verse 12, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, is this part of God's law still valid today? Yes. yes. Now, friends, understand when you're giving this study, you're going to want to stop on the fourth because it's special to you. Don't stop on the fourth. You just keep on going and you let the Spirit of God work on those individuals' hearts for the next seven days until you come back to give them the next Bible study. And then, of course, the topic is the Sabbath and you're going to be focusing on that. But the purpose of this study is just simply to show that every one of the commandments, God still expects us, because we love Him, to keep them. So let's go to the next commandment. This would be the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, is this commandment still valid today? Yes. It is. Let's go to the next commandment. You shall not commit adultery. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, is this commandment still valid today? So remember, what we're doing here is we are just walking through the commandments. We're not focusing on any specific commandment. We're just walking through the commandments and we are asking, does Jesus consider this still valid according to what He said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18? And of course, what is that Bible student going to have to say? They're going to have to say yes. Otherwise, they're going to call Jesus a, a liar. So let's go to our next commandment. Let's go to our next commandment there. You shall not steal. According to the words of Jesus, does he consider this commandment to still be valid today? Yes. He does. All right, and our next commandment? You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What is, what is false witness? 
lying. lying. That's right. Thou shalt not lie. According to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, does he still consider this to be valid today? Yes. He does. And let's go to our last or the tenth commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So according to the words of Jesus, does he consider this commandment to still be valid today? He does. As long as there is an earth and as long as there is a place for us to breathe, as long as there is a heaven, Jesus says not one jot or one tittle will pass from my, pass from my law till all be fulfilled. And did that word fulfill mean to do away with? It didn't. So what we've seen so far is that every aspect of God's law is still valid. Now, the wisest man in the Old Testament was called who? What, did, what was his name? King Solomon. That's absolutely right. And he's the one that wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. Our next reference you'll see there on the screen, our 15th Law of God reference is Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Ecclesiastes. So you have Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. So right after the book of Psalms, you have Proverbs. Then you have Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. And we're going to let Jessica read this for us. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commandments, for this is the duty of every person. So the wisest man on, this, on the earth, save Jesus Christ, of course, says here that the whole duty of man is to do what? Keep His commandments. Now remember, what is our motivation for keeping the commandments of God? Love. Now you must, when you give this Bible study, you must keep that underlying principle there. It was a principle that was listed in the commandment itself. It's a principle that is listed in, in our hearts. That's where the motivation comes. It comes out of a heart, a heart's response of love to what Jesus has done for us. And so what we're pulling out of this reference is the simple fact that the wisest man on the planet, save Jesus Christ, said, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. God expects us to put forth some effort to obey Him, doesn't He? I mean, it doesn't just all of a sudden happen. You and I actually may even need to change our lifestyle. You and I may need to change some of our habits. In some cases, God may even require us to change our jobs in order to keep His commandments. But we can never forget that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you can look that up. It's in Hebrews chapter 13. It's in the first, I think it's the fifth verse actually, where Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Mike's going to check that for me and then we'll, uh, we'll make sure whether that's right or wrong. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the New Testament, our next reference, our 16th reference, we're going to go to the New Testament book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 5. So not St. John, but 1 John. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 5. So you find the book of Revelation and just back up a couple of books, and then you're right there. That's what I did. I went to Revelation, and then I backed, to the, backed up to the left. We're in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, and we are going to let Danielle read that. 1 John chapter 5. Verses 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So notice there in verse 2, when you're giving this study, you want to pull out the references. Was I right about that, that text? 13 verse, five. 13 verse 5. Hebrews 13 verse 5. Praise the Lord, we had it right. So 1 John chapter 5 verse 2 says, By this... We know that we love the children of God. So what is the only way, according to this verse, that you and I can show true love 
to God's children. What does it say there? Well, somebody was starting to say it. When we love God and keep His commandments. So what comes first? Loving God comes first. That is the motivation for keeping God's commandments. Then it says, for this is the love of God. This is how we show God that we love Him. When, that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. It all has to do with our motivation, doesn't it? If we feel like we're forced to do something, do we ever want to do it? When I mean, you think about it, growing up, your, your folks said, go clean your room or you can't go play. We're like, oh, man, I don't want to clean my room. We were forced to do it, but what made us go do it? Our motivation for playing, wasn't it? We wanted to go. So, so our parents used that internal self-motivating aspect to get us to do things. And God says, listen, you love me. Keep my commandments. That's exactly what Jesus says in our next reference. Notice on your screen. We're going to John chapter 14 and verse 15. So John 14 verse 15. Tom, we will let you read this. John chapter 14 and verse 15. So if you'll just read that for us. Everybody's there. Okay. If you love me, keep my commandments. So what, does, what, what color are your, the words there in your Bible in John 14? They're red. They're red. And so Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep what? His commandments. It's interesting. He calls them my commandments. That's interesting, isn't it? Whose commandments are they? Jesus' commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He told us that his commandments in John chapter 5 were not grievous, but that is how we showed others that we loved him or them, and that's how we show God that we love him, by keeping his commandments. So you're giving this Bible study for the purpose of people understanding that God wants us to keep His commandments, not because we have to, but because we love Him. Does that make sense? So now the appeal here. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. My question, Roberto, is how much do you love Jesus? How much is it, is it your desire to love Jesus with all of your heart? Is that your desire? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how much, my friend, do you love Jesus? What is your motivation for keeping the commandments of God? Love. Praise the Lord. And then I pray with Him. Now, you, you, again, I'm just going to reiterate this. You don't focus on any one of the commandments during this study. The purpose is to introduce people that have never heard of the law of God to the law of God. It is also to introduce people that have understood God's law to be different than what it shows in the Bible, the real law of God. And it's also used just to lay that foundation for the study that is going to come next. Do you feel that this study was clear? Sure. Jesus gives us grace to overcome sin, which is the transgression of the law. Very simple. Do away with the law, then you do away with Jesus because you, you don't have sin. You don't need grace to overcome it, so you don't need the one that gives us grace. So what we're going to do here, we've just done a little quick review. We'll go to our next reference. We have simple questions and simple answers. Now you remember, in the very beginning of this Bible study, we used this illustration. In Daniel 7.25, it said that the Antichrist wants to change God's law. In Matthew 5.17 and 18, Jesus said that there would be no change in His law. You remember that illustration. So, then we said, any attempt to change God's eternal law is a product of of the Antichrist. Any attempt to change God's eternal law is a product of the Antichrist. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take probably the most abused reference in Scripture and we are going to look at it. You notice on your screen there, the most, what I feel is the most abused Scripture in Bible is Colossians chapter 2 
verses 14 through 17. So I'm going to grab my Bible here, Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, and I'll just read that for us. So you're turning to Colossians, it's after Corinthians, and you have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. And let's just read it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ." Over and over again, I hear evangelical ministers, even pastors say that this, this reference here is what did away with God's law. But go back, to your, go back to your screen. If we put Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, where God's, to teach that God's law has been changed, then that is a product of who? Antichrist. Antichrist. So are you and I comfortable with Colossians 2, 14 and 17 landing over here under the Antichrist that wants to change God's law? We're not. So this Colossians 2, 14 through 17 must be understood in light of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. That until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle will pass from my law until all be fulfilled. And we learned that the word fulfilled did not mean to do away with. So... Let's just look at our next reference, next slide here. What then was nailed to the cross? What is it that was nailed to the cross? And I'll probably just end up reading all of these here. What was it that was nailed to the cross? You remember in our, on, a, on the graphic there, it says Colossians 2, 14 through 17, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. We're just going to take the Colossians 2, 14 through 17, and we're going to break it down in pieces so that we can understand what is Paul talking about in his letter to the Colossians. So let's go to Deuteronomy 31. We're going to look at this blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. So you're going to the Old Testament. Remember, it's very difficult to understand the New Testament if we do not have the Old Testament. So we're going to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. It says, Deuteronomy 31, 9, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. Go to verse 24. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. Let's ask this question. Did Moses write a book that had the law in it, that had a law in it? He did. What do you suppose Moses wrote that with? His hand. He, he, he definitely wrote it in ink, didn't he? Or some type of writing instrument back then. Then verse 25 says that Moses commanded the Israelites, or the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying... Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the covenant of the Lord, of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So go back to your, your graphic there. The graphic says that, number one, Moses writes a law. Number two, this law is written in a book. Number three, this book was put in the side of the Ark of the Covenant, and this book was there for a witness against us. It was there for a witness against who? Against us. Now, I want you to uh, go back over there to Colossians, Colossians chapter 2. And you may have kept your finger there. I didn't. It would be a good thing for us all to put some type of marker there. So I'll do that in my Bible here. It says in Colossians 2.14, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances 
that was against us, which was contrary to us. According to Deuteronomy 31, was there something written in the law of Moses that he wrote with his hand that was not inside the ark itself, but was on the side of the ark? Was there something written there that was against us? Absolutely. And so you can see very clearly just from verse 14 here in Colossians 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. We can see quite clearly right there that what was nailed to the cross was the ceremonial law that was written by the hand of Moses. Now let's go and let's look at, I think our next slide is going to take us there. Our next slide is going to take us to Exodus 31 and verse 18. Let's go to Exodus 31 verse 18. We're still looking at this handwriting of ordinances. So I'm going to keep my marker there in Colossians, but I'm going back to Exodus, Genesis, Exodus 31 and verse 18. Exodus 31 and verse 18. The Bible says here, Exodus 31, verse 18, And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of what? Stone, written with the finger of God. Now, Mike, you'll appreciate this because you have, you have young children like I do, and I told my kids one day in morning worship, we always try to have morning worship, we always have morning worship before we come to school, so on and so forth, and I said, God wrote it with His finger, and my boy Brandon goes, how did He do that? Wouldn't that be cool to write on stone with your finger? Can any human write on stone with their finger? They can't. Only God can write on something that will last for eternity. And he doesn't even use his whole hand. He just uses his finger. The law that was nailed to the cross, the law that was blotted out, was the law of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And that, according to Deuteronomy 31 and Exodus 31, is the law that Moses wrote, not the law that God wrote. Does this make sense so far? So again, we're just breaking down uh, Colossians chapter 2. Let's look now at Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Deuteronomy chapter 10. So you have Genesis, Exodus, you'll just keep turning to the right, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says here, Deuteronomy 10, Verse 1, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first. You remember Moses broke the first two tables when he came down from Mount Sinai and the children of Israel were worshiping a golden calf. They broke the commandments. He broke them by dropping them or throwing them down. And come up unto me into the mount and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And thou shalt put them where? In the ark. In the ark. Where was Moses' law put? Beside. Beside or in the side of the ark. So God's law, the Ten Commandments, is inside, underneath the mercy seat, showing that God's law is the foundation for God's government. But Moses' law, the law of ordinances the law that contained instructions about meat and drink and festivals, uh, the new moon celebration, and the Sabbath days. You understand there in Colossians chapter 2 that Sabbath days is plural. In the commandments we just read, it said the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And so there's a differentiation there. There were feast days in the Jewish cultural system that were considered Sabbaths or days of rest. And so there are these days in the Old Testament and then in the Jewish economy, the Jewish civilization, where they kept other days 
than the seventh day Sabbath as a holy day. And so that's the Sabbath days that are spoken of there. So let's continue on here. And make verse 3. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in my hand. And he, speaking of God, wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. Verse 5. And I turned myself and came down from the mount, and put the tables where? In the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. So let's go now back to our graphic there. The law which was against us, that was nailed to the cross, was the law that Moses wrote. Moses wrote a law that was put on the side of the ark. God writes a law that is put inside the ark. Was there anything in God's law that was not for us, that was not designed to protect us? No. God's law was designed to be for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? So we follow God's law as an expression of our love for Him. Now, if you take the time, you can read in Leviticus chapter 23, and you can actually see when you read that whole chapter in Leviticus chapter 23, that there are several feast days in the Jewish economy called Sabbaths. But then it differentiates those besides the Sabbath of the Lord. So very quickly, I'm going to Leviticus, and I'll just point out the exact verse there. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 38. Notice Leviticus 23 verse 38 says, Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord. So you see that there is the seventh day Sabbath, and then there are other Sabbath days in the Jewish economy. When Christ was nailed to the cross, all of those things that were a shadow of the Christ that was to come, or of Jesus Christ, when Christ was hung on the cross, no longer did the sacrifices have any meanings, no longer did the meat offerings, the drink offerings, the feasts, none of that had any more meaning because the true Lamb of God had been slain on the cross. Now you, my friend, are able to give a study on the law of God that would draw people to love Him and obey Him.